Okay, here we go. We have Ori Spado, who some people call the mob boss of Hollywood. That's what some people say. Yeah, welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Well, this is your first time here, so I want to start in the very beginning. Uh, you were born December, December 17th, 1944. That's in correct. Rome, New York. Right. Okay. And uh, I guess your grandfather and your grandfather's brother were a part of the mafia back in Italy. Yes. Okay. And it was Calabria? Calabria, yeah. Calabria. The Andergrata is called. Okay. So how much did you know about what they were doing? I, as a child, I didn't really know anything. I was... Only when, i be honest with you, it was the evening of my stag party. After everybody left, my father and I sat in a restaurant called San Carlos Restaurant. And my father started telling me stories. Okay. Mm. Was your father involved in the mafia at all? No, he was not. Okay, so your grandfather... My grandfather. Just that cut, was cut him cut off, off from all that. Okay. And then somehow I got into my blood. Okay. And from what I understand... The mafia is only in Italy. In the U.S., it's La Cosa Nostra. Yes. Okay. And I'll, I'll but also... I want to make it... There is a difference between the Sicilian mafia, Napoletans, which you call the Camarao, and the uh, Calabria, which is called the Andragata. Okay. What's, difference, what's the difference with the Calabria? Well, the Calabrians are more... It's more family... Real family, blood brothers, sisters, cousins, and uh, they're actually big, the biggest one of them all. Okay. Throughout the world. And you know, and I've sp spoken to different mob guys over the years, and they said how, like in Italy, it's a little bit different. Like, for example, the Italians would go after the police and politicians and stuff like that, whereas in the U.S., you never really see that. Uh. That was brought upon uh, different organizations in Italy. Yes, they did go after them. Uh, I can't be on. I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, but it is a rule in this country. You know, uh, we always have a saying, they're doing their job, we're doing ours. And from what, from what I've heard, and you actually said this in one of your interviews, Originally, the mafia formed as of a like a protection. Like I remember, there was this one guy. Um, he played a uh, big pussy on uh, the Sopranos. I heard an interview saying that it formed. It was like a mob. I guess a girl had gotten raped. Yes. And a woman was like mafia. My my daughter in and then, Sicily. Yes. So you heard uh, about the when same the thing. French invaded uh, uh, Sicily. Uh, that actually happened. It happened in a park, from my understanding, on a Sunday afternoon when one of the French soldiers uh, raped uh, one of the women. And then it just spread through Italy. And it was to protect our own. And that's how it was when they came over to this country, to protect our own. Right. So you were born in the 40s. And... You went to high school, and you ended up joining the U.S. Army at yes. 18. And where were you stationed? I was stationed at the school field barracks, Hawaii. Okay, so you never saw any battle or anything of that sort. I can't discuss that. Okay. <laughs> and you were uh, honorably discharged in 1966. Yes. And you came back to Rome, New York. Correct. You ended up getting into the uh, insurance business at that point. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And at this point, were you totally legit, or were there things that were happening outside of your, your regular job? I was a totally legitimate person. I did extremely well in the insurance business. Uh, I was with the Prudential Insurance Company. I was a member of the Million Dollar Roundtable. And uh, then I wanted to uh, transfer to California. And I put a request into my manager, Sully Caradella, his name was, a uh, request to be transferred to Los Angeles. 
And time went on, time went on, and I'm not hearing nothing. I keep confronting them all. I got to hear from the home office. And one day I was at my stockbroker's office, and the manager from John Hancock was there. He said, you want to go to California and get you a job right now. And he had me a job lined up. Our offices were on, uh, on Beverly Boulevard right next to CBS. Merv Griffin's office was upstairs of me. And okay. came so to you, California. So you're in Los Angeles selling insurance. And I was here with my first wife and my daughter. Mm -hmm. And we only stayed a year then. And because we had a lot of real estate and other holdings back in upstate New York, uh, I went back there to straighten things out. Ended up starting a business called the Ori Agency, which was selling the automobile dealer. I trained automobile dealers back in the day. They say I'm one of the pioneers in what's called the TO business. Turn over a customer to the finance manager, to the after sale manager, and whatever you want to call them. I grew, I was doing several millions of dollars a year. Uh, a gentleman named Frank Russo, who was a lawyer. His father was also Frank Russo, who was the boss in the old days in rural New York. And Frank told me a lot about my grandfather, uh, that he used to open the, uh, uh, the doors on, uh, the cellar doors on a Saturday morning and only a few people were allowed. My grandfather was one of them. And to Frank, Frank was well known to a lot of people. It was Frank who introduced me to Frank Costello. Now, although I only met Frank Costello a couple times, it was before his death. He died in 1973. We met at the Waldorf. It was Frank Costello who told me, always be a gentleman. And I met Russell Buffalino, had lunch with him, who Joe Pesci just played in The Irishman. Uh huh. Okay, so you actually knew him? Yes. Uh, did you know The Irishman? No, I did not know Frank Sherman. Uh, did you know Jimmy Hoffa? Never met Jimmy Hoffa. My father did. Okay, but you knew the, the Joe Pesci character. What was his name again? Russell Buffalino. Russell Buffalino. Now, I just watched The Irishman. Russell seemed kind of like a middleman between sort of everybody. Was that a good way to describe him? He was a powerful guy, quiet guy. Uh, yes, he was, he ran a, a great organization, may I say. Any stories stand out to him during your uh, dealings with him? Well, I know he had, uh, I don't know if it was his brother's child or maybe it was his child from another wife or something. He supposedly only married once, but uh, in Rome we had a place, it was called the Rome State School, where uh, children with difficulties uh, went and... Uh, I went with, it was Frank Russo's responsibility to check on this young kid uh, for Russell. Then when Russell was arrested and they were transported to New York, uh, he ended up in the Oneida County Jail. On a, and he was there for a few nights. And I would go with Frank, because you know, in those days we had things pretty well locked down and upstate New York, and they allowed us in, and we bring us spaghetti, meatballs, sausage, and, you know, real Italian meals. Okay. So at what point did your association with organized crime begin? I never considered myself affiliated with anybody. I always considered myself a renegade, 
Uh, in my book, The Accidental Gangster, I turned it down twice to become a made man. Okay, which families offered you uh, to become uh, a man? Once out here on the West Coast, and once Sonny said, no, you're not getting made there, you're getting made here. So the Colombo family offered you yeah. to be made. Okay, and we'll, we'll get into that whole part of the story and so forth. So you're in, in Rome, New York, and you're, you know some of these, these criminal figures. Did you start doing crimes back in, in Rome, or is it until you moved back to Los Angeles? Well, you know, depends what you call crimes. Here's what happened. And I'm going to tell more about it in my second book. It's called about my, my journey through the judicial system. Uh, I had a legitimate business, the Ori Agency, and I came up with an idea of how to bring this on a national basis, and I needed $12 million. I'm going back early 70s, $12 million, a lot of money. But I came up with a way to bring this national. I was a legitimate businessman doing several millions of dollars a year. I had agents throughout New York State and I had over 250 automobile dealers as clients of mine. And We uh, were in Boston when they were filming the Briggs job with John Cassavetes, Peter Falk, and uh, uh, the, uh, actually the guy who actually performed the Briggs job. Russ Serpy and Dino De Laurentiis uh, were filming. Russ Serpy was the producer on that. And I explained to Ralph what I needed because I knew Dino was like magic, he could raise money from anywhere. Dino, that was his forte, raising money and getting money for film. And so I put the plan together. We flew out uh, to Beverly Hills, met with Dino De Laurentiis. He loved the idea. I brought him, I demonstrated what we called the Ori Method uh, in downtown LA Motors back then. And in the meantime, while I'm doing all this traveling and on airplanes and everything, one of the guys that I worked for found out about a deal that I had with the insurance company where I was allowed to use the premiums to grow the business. Because here again, this insurance company was out of Michigan. I was their golden boy. I'm bringing them millions of dollars a year. And he found out, getting drunk one night, dating my secretary, and was out with my account. Only three people besides the insurance company knew about the deal. Me, my brother, and my accountant. Nobody else knew. And uh, Generelli found out about it. He threatened the insurance company that he would blow them into the New York State Insurance Department. Uh, happened on the same day that I flew back from San Francisco where I was with a girl that became my second wife. My first wife picks me up at the airport in Fort Lauderdale. And as we're driving to the condo, I'm telling her, look, we got a lot of money. We own this property, that property. Let's get a divorce. We're still young. You're beautiful. You can find somebody. And then when we walked into my condo, my kids, my mother, I remember looking out my patio window and they're on the beach playing. My phone rings and it was my bookkeeper telling me that Dick Leamy called. He's at LaGuardia Airport. He's coming in to close my business. But he wanted me to call him. I called Dick, I said, what are you talking about? He explains to me. He said, can you get the money? Uh, the money was tight in the banks and so forth in those days. So I got on a plane, flew back, had Frank Russo and my banker in my office. 
I needed three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, something like that. And I already owed the bank maybe close to a million. And it was a small bank and that was the maximum loans they could make. So I looked at Frank, I says, Frank, I said, what's the worst that could happen? He says, You're looking at fifty years in jail. <laughs> I says, what are you, are you going to represent me? He, Frank says, no. He says, oh, yeah, I'm too old to represent you. He says, I recommend Louis Brindisi. We got Louis Brindisi. And in the meantime, I was trying to raise the money, came this close to it, because I felt if I could pay that off, I still got my other businesses, everything be all right. Needless to say, I lost everything. Four and a half years later, I got indicted on mail fraud. And that was the beginning, my first felony in federal court in Syracuse, New York. Been a felon all my life, I'll die a felon. <laughs> so uh, what, what happened next in terms of your career? Well, you know, through, you know, I met Sonny Frances. In the meantime, uh, Meyer Lansky used to stay at the Warwick Hotel, the suite, he had the suite above me. I would walk with him every evening with his dog down 54th Street, make a left on 5th to 57th, right around back to 50, uh, 57, back to 54th Street, down 6th Avenue. And uh, that is probably It's not like I said I'm going to start doing crimes. But they took my insurance license away from me. And that was a very pivotal moment in my life because that was my means making... I really enjoyed the insurance business. And... Uh, but even then, they were trying to set me up. They had this guy, Jim Generelli, who was the first guy to ever become an informant against me, try to set me up, calling me up, asking me about my friend Sonny Frances, Meyer Lansky, and I felt something funny over the phone. And I would say, I don't know who these guys are you're talking about. Perhaps I read their name in a newspaper. Uh, in other words, what I'm saying, I was probably a natural for the life. Okay, so Sonny Frances, was the underboss yes. of the Colombo crime family. And he was really like very high profile in terms of the FBI going after him, him being in the newspapers and everything else like that. He was not one of these undercover guys that you never hear of. He was like a John Gotti type character. Uh, Sonny was, Sonny's a very smart individual, which I later found out after his eyes almost killed me. At his, I sat down in the Russian tea room, which is in my book, and that's the reason why Michael Frances did not like me. But I never liked Michael either. Well, I interviewed Michael uh, Frances a couple times. Yes. And uh, we brought your name up. Yes. Did you watch the interview? Absolutely. He knew your father, uh, I guess, very well. That's and correct. He said at one point your father actually put a hit out on him. Do you know about this? Put a hit out on Ori? Yeah. No, I don't know that to be a fact, but uh, Ori's a bad guy. I mean, Ori used my father's name, used my name, threatened people as a result of that. Uh, he was doing some illicit things with my brother. I think he was feeding my brother drugs. I think when my brother finally straightened out a little bit when he was living with me out here, you know, in the early 2000s, I think Ori put him back on drugs. I don't like Ori Spado, and uh, he won't come near me, regardless of what he might have said in that interview. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not aware of the interview, so I don't know if he said anything uh, about anything, but he's a liar. Uh, I wouldn't believe anything that he says. Um. Okay. So, first of all, before we get into, into this part of the story, at one point, uh, Sonny Franzis put a hit out on you. Well, let me explain how that happened. Okay. I was rocking and rolling. I'm out here in California. 
And I was taking care of John Franchise. I bailed John Franchise out of jail a couple of times. And that's Every, Sonny's, Sonny's son. Sonny's real son. Right. Yeah. Who, who was a, a drug addict. Yes. Uh, I kept drug dealers away from him. Michael says, and I'm, this pisses me off, Michael, okay? I never gave Johnny any fucking drugs. He was a drug dealer. He was on drugs since 1980. After that interview, I got a call from their next door neighbor. But I know the story. And I'm going to tell you something else. Johnny got sober because of me. What happened was my son was doing a party at a nightclub down on Wilshire Boulevard. And Johnny wanted to go to it. He came, he was high. I said, you ain't going, John. And I had a girlfriend that was a drug addict. She ended up dying uh, as a result of the, her drugs. So I was pretty familiar uh, because I tried helping my girlfriend, been to AA meetings, all or not. I went through all that there. And Hope said I was going to be the savior. And so I told John, I said, you're not going. I said, here's what you're going to do. I'm bringing you over to Cedars. You're going to tell them you jumped in front of my car, try to kill yourself. They'll put you in Thalians for 72 hours. I said, you're not going to my son's party. I don't want you at that club. And uh, that's what I did. But unfortunately, he left there. At 4 a.m. in the morning, he's knocking on my freaking door. I, I don't even know I got my building because it's a secure building. He, but he got in. I said, he's want to sleep on my couch. I said, no, Johnny. Stay right there. I got dressed. I took him in the car. Now, I can't just put somebody on the street. So I was looking for a hotel for him in Santa Monica. And they were all full. So I brought him to the coffee bean. I'm sitting down, having coffee. Had a talk with him. And he wanted to go to his brother's house. Now, I knew where Michael lived. I know where every house Michael's ever had out there. I don't give a shit. I know what Michael is. So I told Johnny, I'll drive you. You can walk the rest of the way. And I dropped him off on a corner. And what happened, and we didn't find out until a year later, he heard voices coming from a building. Now, with all the rehabs and all the meetings he's been to, this meeting changed him. It happened to be an AA meeting that he walked into where he heard the voices. I didn't hear it from Johnny for a year. And then I get a call. Johnny called me uncle. He said, Uncle Lori, I've been sober for a year. He told me the story over the phone. He says, I'm getting my year, what do they call it? The year pin or whatever they get. He said, I really would love for you and Anthony to be there. And Anthony and I were there for his year because that was a big thing for him. I was very happy for Johnny that he found it because unless you want it, you're not going to sober up. And at that meeting, and Johnny's a good talker, gave a good speech, great speech. And he says, I'm so happy my Uncle Lori and my cousin Anthony are here. He said that. He said, I hope I'm allowed in his home again. Unfortunately, he was. But my understanding, John was wearing a wing for the Sheriff's Department here in Los Angeles. Uh, he did get married. He married this girl. Denise, we went to the wedding, and then Michael walked in with his wife. I said, hello, and we walked out. 
Right, because Johnny eventually got back on drugs. Yeah. And the wire that he wore was used to convict his father. Well, no, that's... I said, that's a different he, part? Oh, yeah, Johnny Johnny was in a... I found this out in, in court in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, because they try to say that I sold Johnny a gun and Johnny was wired up with the sheriff's department in Los Angeles against me trying to get information. I never sold Johnny a gun, never sold nobody a gun. But they wanted, they trying to build additional, and that's when it came. My attorney asked, wanted that tape and wanted that gun. Guess what? They could never find it. The sheriff's department didn't have it. Or they just didn't, they did have a tape. But I'm sure Johnny, Johnny was an informant. I never trusted Johnny as far as doing anything illegal with. And he would come and say, my father said this, my, you know, and I'd give bullshit stories to Johnny. Johnny taped me out in Farmingdale at a diner. I was taped. When Johnny got on the witness stand, and the U.S. attorney asked him, who are friends of your father? My name was the very first. I had the court transcript. I could back up on everything I say. He says, Ori Spade has been friends with my father for over 35 years. What's Ori Spade do? Ori Spade has done nothing all his life but deal drugs. Mm. And he went on about me. His father's had thousands of friends back in New York, but I'm the first one he brings up. Mm. And then when prosecuting uh, defense attorney got up and said, you said Mr. Spado never worked a day in his life. Yeah, that's true. What about the 15 years Mr. Spado provided entertainment to the Queen Mary in Long Beach, California? Oh, I forgot about that. What about when Mr. Spado was going to work with Andrea Bocelli? Or he knew Andrea? I don't know where this thing he said. I would have loved to meet him. Or he never told me that. But as far as the hit is concerned, Sonny sent this guy I met the first tape conversation because me and my co-defendant Chris, we listened to our discovery every opportunity we had. There was over 500 tapes, seven hours each, 3,500 hours of discovery. And Guy Furtado, came to California, and he's sitting on my couch. At the same time, that a Jamaican boy named Ricky Lee, Ricky Durant, he was a big dealer, marijuana, cocaine. Uh, he got busted. I was lawyering him up. He was in downtown NDC, Los Angeles. His wife came over with two Mexicans, who I happen to know. And Ricky had a half a million dollars on the streets in Brooklyn and hold it to these two Mexicans. And I happened to know the guys in Brooklyn. I called up and they said, Ori, right, look it. You know, we have a hundred thousand ready. We're not dodging this. Fatato heard they had the hundred. He said, I could have that picked up right now. And he did. He had somebody pick it up. I didn't know who. Later found out it was the FBI. They didn't bust these guys. They took the money. The first hundred grand Furtado sent something back to me. In the meantime, Furtado is telling these guys, look, we'll get your money, but you got to give us 50 kilo every two weeks. You know, you know Ori is good, and now he's saying he's got me involved in the cocaine deal of 50 kilos. <laughs> These guys ain't going to give us 50 kilos so they got their half a million. Now, Fatato, when he goes back to, well, before he goes back to North, he says, Sonny said he wants you to introduce me to his son, Johnny. So I called Johnny, thinking I'm introducing these guys. 
but they already knew who the freak each other were. Hmm. Went to the Abbey restaurant. I'm sitting between the both of them, and they're both wired. <laughs> So, Fatato's going back to New York, he's talking to Michael Carapano, telling Michael Carapano all the money we're going to make from this big cocaine deal that Ori's putting together. Ori's putting together. There was no cocaine deal. I was never going to do a cocaine deal. I tried to grab 50 grand from him, tell him I needed money up front. I never got it. Never got the other 400000 Now, because there's no cocaine deal, he's telling Michael Carapano, or oh, he's been doing the fucking deal and he's fucking us. Can I say fuck? Yeah, go ahead. Or he's fucking us. So now, here's Michael Carapano and I, we never discussed drugs. I never talked. I never had to report. Sonny was my friend. Sonny's the guy I talked to. Nobody else. And so he's riling up Michael Carapano, and Michael goes to Sonny and says, Sonny, how much I'm fucking him, all this money, and gets permission to whack me. So I'm on a tape. Which eventually worked out to my benefit. So there is a tape of Sonny approving a, yes. hit, a hit on you. Yes, as there is where Sonny is saying that he had to go vote and gave approval to whack John Gotti Jr. Right, and Sonny also, they say, approved a hit on his own son, Johnny, as well as Michael Frenzies. Well, let me tell you something. I only got upset with Sonny for one reason. See, Sonny would call me in the f New York to come in for dinner, like he did this morning when he and I talked. When are you coming to see me? When are you coming to see me? And I'm going to tell you something. Sonny sounds like the same guy I met over 40 years ago. I don't have to say, hi, this is Ori. He said, hey, Ori, what are you doing, buddy? He knows who I am bearing my voice. But I wanted to check things out this morning. So I, when the nurse answered the phone, See, when you call that nurse, you know where Sonny's at. You get the receptionist downstairs. You don't have to say, I want to speak to John Frangie. Sonny, please. And they transfer you upstairs. Everybody knows him there. They love him. Now, since that interview did with Michael, I've had over 10 phone calls from people back east. About my interview. About your interview with Michael and what Michael said. And, you know... I sort of feel sorry for Michael, I gotta be honest with you. And I'll tell you why. He's living a life that's not his own life. He should f wake up, face who he really is. I mean, he proclaims to be a born again Christian, correct? Right. Well, then that means he reads the Bible. Right. Now, look, I don't go to church. I was born a Catholic, I'll die a Catholic. I go to church when there's nobody there, once every couple of months maybe, so I could have a talk with the guy one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know a damn thing about a Catholic religion. I don't know nothing about any religion. But I do know certain things. And I think it's Exodus 20, 16 in the Bible. If you're going out preaching it, then you should live it. And I feel that's what Michael should do. You don't think he's living a, a godly life? He's living life? his father's life. He's very jealous of his father. He hasn't seen Sonny in a year. He proclaims he's there all the time. He claims I use his fucking name. You think I'm going to use a rat's name? And you show me anybody that calls somebody else a rat, they're the rat. Right, because he, he said that he felt that you actually... Bullshit. Show uh, me a 5K1. Show me a proffer statement. Show me a reverse proffer statement. You won't find one in my entire fucking lifetime. And not a person has been investigated, arrested, or anything 
because of Ori Spadel. I can look in a mirror. I could put my head on a pillow and I go to sleep. But what about Michael Franche? You want to talk about who he read it? Huh? I got a piece of paper here. I got a fucking list of shit about him that I know. I know he's got $50 million in Panama. Or at least that's where it originally was. You want to know who put it there? I know the lawyer. I'm not going to tell you his name. All right? His initials, R.P. Oh, I know. I guess you saw the internet. All right, what about the janitor? What about Norby Waters? When he was on the stand testifying against Norby Waters, you got to remember, everybody he talks about are friends of his father's. Me reach out for Michael Franchese? Not in this fucking lifetime. Why would I reach out to a rat? Why? You got an answer to that? No. You would like to see my court record? I was in general population of every prison I was in. He talks about John Gotti being punked. What the fuck does he know about John Gotti? John Gotti was not punked by anybody in prison. I'm not a John Gotti by far. But I was respected as an Italian gangster in prison. As every Italian gangster who is not an informant is respected in prison. Did you know John Gotti? I met John Gotti twice with Sonny. Gotcha. I did not, we didn't have conversations. Hello, John, did John, this is Ori, da, 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 that there. Well, how did you get the title of Mob Boss of Hollywood? Because By you they, I say in my book. Okay, but you weren't part of any actual mob. No. You weren't. I had my own crew. Yeah. I may have got the ability to do things. And I did things my way. Right. You weren't a Columbo. I got involved in Hollywood through Dino and uh, through the people in the entertainment business. I became a fixer. I did things quietly. I never needed the gang of guys to go after anybody. How big was your crew? I had four or five guys. Okay. You know, you went through some of your stories in your book about some of the things that you did. I remember there was one story about Naomi Campbell. She had a stalker. Yes. And you showed up at the stalker's house. and sent I didn't show up. I had two guys show you up. You had two guys show up, and they threatened him. They didn't threaten him. They put him on the phone with me. Okay. More or less threatened him. <laughs> well, it wasn't really a threat. I gave him proper advice. Not to see her again, or else. I never threaten nobody. I just give people proper advice. You look at a situation like that, and compared to some of the stories I've heard about the mob, it seems relatively tame. What were some of the more serious situations that you got into? You know, a stalker is not that much of a threat. No. I could go deal with a stalker myself. That's right. You got to find him first. Right. But still, not a huge threat. No. What were some of the really serious situations you got to, especially in Hollywood? I don't discuss all those things. Okay. I mean, it's past the statute of limitations. Pardon? Uh, it's past the statute of limitations. It's not a question of that there. It's a question of naming people. That there's no sense in dragging other people's names into it. Uh, there was a, a particular actor that... It, I did things nicely. Are you talking about people? Um, what's your question here? Um, what's the worst thing that I ever done? Yeah. Please clarify that. What do you mean? What's the most violent thing you ever did? Oh, Jesus. I can't remember. <laughs> okay. At one point, you met Haitian Jack. Yeah. Uh, I know Haitian Jack as well. We've had a few conversations. Haitian Jack ended up being tied into the whole Tupac story later on. Correct. But you knew him earlier. And at one before point... Before Tupac? No, I didn't know him before Oh, Tupac. this was after Tupac. Was what? Tupac died? Tupac died in 1996. 96? Yeah. And yeah, that's I around... I Jack that, after that. 
Okay, so you met him around 97, 98? No, I had to be around 2000, 2001, maybe. Okay, so later on. At one point, he ended up sleeping on your couch for like a year, is what for you said? For a year. How do you let this stranger end up sleeping on your couch for an extended period of time like that? He's clearly not a family member. Not a family member. I, you know what? How did I do that? I don't know. I would never do it again. I can tell you that much. Uh, how did I do that? He came. He was introduced to me by Danny Sims. And Danny Sims was a real good guy. Danny Sims, the guy that first produced Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. And uh, when in L.A., I was Danny's guy. When in New York, Joe Pony was his guy. When in London, my mate, Joey Pyle, was his guy. And he came back. Uh, he was coming back. He stopped in New York. He was with Wyclef, met Haitian Jack, came out. And one thing led to another. And Haitian Jack ended up sleeping on my couch. Uh, he was a little nervous about some things. And he's a good talker, Haitian Jack. Good looking boy. Uh, unfortunately, he was another rat. He was saying that he cooperated with the police? Yeah. On what exactly? Several things, from my understanding. Uh, a lot of the same drug dealers that he robbed ended up going to prison. It's a convenient way to get rid of them so they don't come after you, right? Uh, so you're saying that he robbed drug dealers and then cooperated? Not, you know, I don't know that for sure. I know he robbed drug dealers. That I can say for sure. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people went to prison around them. And... It wasn't until people started telling me and he Bush's story he was coming out with. And for me to go to Jack, I never reached out to Jack to do record scams. I didn't need Jack for that shit if I was gonna do it. There's a boy doing a lot of couple of boys in prison doing who done time who were out of time out of jail. I remember getting ready for court in Brooklyn. And they bring in, they put you in one room, you chain and shackles. And I'm sitting there, I'm talking to a guy. There's about 15 guys around this little cell. And I'm hearing a guy go, Beverly Hills, Ori Spradle. I look up like this. I says, you know me? He said, you forgot who I was. It was the guy that Jack had over after Jack got his own apartment above me. Same building. And he was in prison. Jack didn't do nothing for him. I had to feed the kid. I can't remember his name either. And then when I was in Lompoc, I was at the microwave oven one morning. Before they unlocked the doors, I tried to use the microwave before it's busy all day. And I hear somebody going, Ori Spado. I turn around, it's a guy, everybody, his name's Horatio Hamilton, he's known as Romy. Romy was a major drug dealer of marijuana of over a thousand pounds a week and there's once again I can't prove it because I didn't go digging into the files or anything not my business uh, but Romy got a gang at time and he told me he was talking to Jack and Ricky, I said, why are you talking to these two rats for? Well, because, you know, Jack's a Haitian. 
Romy's Jamaican, Ricky's a Jamaican, he's talking to them. But at the same time, I received in the mail a story that Haitian Jack is saying about Ori Spade or some ex-detective named Courtney, I think it was Courtney. And I read all this stuff, it was all bullshit. I said, give me Jack's number. Now, I didn't want to call Ricky, because I had the proof of Ricky proffering against me. After I helped him, he proffered against me and Jimmy Henchman. And uh, you do know what a proffer is, right? Yeah. Uh, So I put Jack on my list for one day, and I called him up. Here I am in Lompoc prison. I'm calling Haitian Jack in the Dominican. I said, what's this fucking bullshit you're doing? That's not me, it's not me, I swear. That's Jimmy Henchman. Right, because at one point, uh, Haitian Jack got deported, and yeah. he ended up in the, in the Dominican Republic. That's yeah, I because he was... He was playing both ends against the middle, trying to be the gangster and trying to give the FBI information. He's working with the cops. He's in between them both. So he gave a lot of information to the cops, but he also bullshitted them a lot. Mm. And what was your relationship with uh, Jimmy Henchman? Jimmy and I were very good friends. Okay. I know Jimmy. I've interviewed him. Yeah, well, I I knew him. Yeah, I knew him back when he was managing game, and then, you know, I interviewed him while he was in prison. Jimmy was a good guy. Jimmy knew where I stayed in New York because every time I was in New York, Jimmy came to visit me, and so he knew exactly where I stayed. Mm -hmm. So, when Jack concocted this story about me doing drugs with some. I forgot when that, the A-ish brother. I don't know who the A-ish brothers are. If it was Jimmy Henchman giving that, Jimmy Henchman would have recommend, would have known the area and everything. It wasn't Jimmy. I know that for a fact. Because I'm making a habit of not telling anybody what the fuck I'm doing. Why, why am I going to go around telling people what I'm doing? In today's world, people know what the hell you're doing. Well, at one point, you were kind of brought in to try to mediate the situation between Harry O and Suge Knight. Yes. Now, Harry O, you know, for those that Michael don't know. Michael Harris. Michael Harris, a uh, major drug dealer from Los Angeles who ended up getting, I don't know, 30 years or something like that. Oh, uh, that was just his state time, wasn't that? Yeah, it was and a lot. And now he's in federal. Yeah, he's supposed to be getting out soon. Allegedly. Allegedly? Allegedly. There, there was news that he, he was out, but he's not out yet. Uh, I actually checked on that. But the story goes, and it's kind of a, a very fuzzy story, that he was the one that put up the initial seed money for Death yes, Row he Records. Did. Yes, he did. Uh, you know, him and Shug had a good relationship at one point, and then once Death Row Records started to get, you know, blow up, Suge ended up distancing himself from Harry O, and it turned into a big, a big mess. You know, at the end of the day, Lydia Harris ended up filing a lawsuit against Death Row, and since Suge never showed up to court, she was given a default judgment, and Death Row Records eventually just went away. Right. But you were brought in back when they were still trying to work it out. Yeah, it was still Death Row Records. Uh, Danny brought Lydia. Danny said he brought Lydia to me. Uh... And she would get Michael on the telephone, or Michael would get her on the phone. Right, because he was in prison this whole he time. He was in prison. He was in, yeah. I think he was in Lancaster, I can't remember. Uh, and Michael and I would talk. I, I never met Michael face to face yet. Uh, he's a real man. Someday I'd like to meet him. Stand up guy. But you I weren't able you to help that. Deal. But you weren't able to actually fix that situation. No, it was a situation that I really shouldn't have involved myself that too much in. Uh, 
because you know when you have two interviews like you got to be able to sit the people down okay because you know there's three sides to every story yours mine and the truth yeah and that's the purpose of I could never get the two of them to sit down. But Suge and I eventually did become friends. Right, and you said that Suge is a stand-up guy. Very stand-up. Yeah, he's currently serving 28 years in prison. Yeah. Yeah, some people can't stop. But Suge, to me, was Suge was very respectful. You know, we collected a million dollars from him out of London. And I only asked for 10% on that there. And it was in my bank the next day. So you made 100000 Yeah. Uh, deal I split it with my friends in London. Right. Well, hold on a second. Let me just pull this up. Are we good? Yeah, yeah. So all these years, you're doing various things. You're fixing situations in Hollywood, you're involved in legal and illegal activities, but you never really do any prison time along the way. You, you get your five years probation early on. Right. You get a day or two here and there, but then 2008 rolls around and you get wrapped up in a RICO charge along with a Colombo crime family. Yeah. What exactly were you being charged with? I was charged with conspiracy to distribute cocaine, and I was charged with a home invasion, robbery, and just supposedly I was the boss of the home invasion, the robbery. Which home got invaded? Uh, I was a drug dealer. The drug dealer actually got deported. It was his wife's safe. All right. Supposedly it was a million dollars, but and I lawyered the guy out in New York when they transferred him to be deported. I got him the lawyer in New York, and the lawyer got him a real good deal. Instead of doing time, he just got him deported. So he was fortunate. He was back in Jamaica. I was at Ricky Lee's house one night when the wife pulled in with her van and had the safe in it, and wanted Ricky to open it up, and left it there. And uh, there was a million dollars, because he would not give the safe. And then Ricky said he just gave the safe back to where he wanted nothing to do with it. Then she came to me, I met her at Marie Collender's on Wilshire Boulevard, and uh, we had a talk, and she wanted, I said maybe we could do a set up robbery. So basically, she was involved with this. She knew what was going to happen, uh, how the safe was going to come out of her house. And so she'd have an excuse to tell her husband that she got robbed. <laughs> so she was trying to steal the money herself? Huh? She was trying to steal the money herself? Yeah. Okay. And she had, her niece was there. And, and in fact, she didn't answer the door the first time when the guys got there. And the guys called me, and I called her, and then she answered the door. But, you know, conveniently for the FBI, they couldn't find her. They said she fled the country. They didn't want to bring her because they know if she bought her, those charges would have been dropped. And my friend Chris Karanovic and I never would have gone to prison. Well, what does the Colombo crime family have to do with this whole situation? I don't know. I'll because, tell you why. Because it, it said, I mean, when I looked it up, it was part of a RICO indictment having to do with the Columbos. Yeah. That's the irony of a RICO indictment. They can indict you for nothing. I believe that the firmly believe why I got involved in that there RICO indictment and brought out. In 1997, an FBI agent in Los Angeles looked at me and said, I will see the day you're chained, shackled, put on Con Air, and brought to Brooklyn. 90, 1997. 11 years later, he made that a reality. 
Now that same agent got demoted, and from my understanding, it was my doing that he got demoted off the organized crime task force. You know, he probably owes me a favor because he came pretty big in the fugitive squad of the FBI. Actually, he's the head of it now, in my understanding. I see him on TV once in a while. Uh, okay. And so he's that that was I taped the FBI. I had twelve tapes. Because they came to me to try to be an informant. They were offering me money. How much did they offer you? Uh, I got five thousand here, five thousand there. Uh And, oh, there was a guy they brought in. I was also the guy that uncovered this FBI agent, and a the guy they brought in that was a flip-flop guy, the guy from New Jersey, that they flipped, and they tried to get him to infiltrate the people out here in Los Angeles, and particularly Joe Denti. Now, Joe and I knew each other. I met him through Jimmy Kachi. And we liked each other. I ate at Frankie's all the time, and Joe was there every night. Joe was a diabetic, I'm a diabetic. And we met on a few occasions. And one day I get a call from Joe and asked me to come up to his house. He said, Ori, he said, I was in Frankie's last night. These guys want to give me this jewelry, want to give me watches. This is a guy named Todd. They said they're from Baltimore. I said, Joey, there's nobody in Baltimore anymore. Not that we know of. And uh, he said, well, gee, if you find anything out, let me know. The following week, my girlfriend had got out of a recovery home. And so I was going to order dinner in. I got her sober. And I called Frankie's, ordered a meal. And then another guy that I knew needed a hundred bucks. I says, meet me. He was in a porn business. I said, meet me at Frankie's. I'll give you the hundred bucks. And I went to Frankie's. I got there. I went, picked up my meals, had a glass of wine. Uh, I think the guy's name was Norm. And uh, I give him the hundred bucks. Now, Frankie's got a very small bar. It's not big. There was nobody at the bar. I had my glass of wine, I left. The next day, he calls me up, this guy, that I gave on your bar. He said, there were two friends here at the bar. And we were talking, and he, he was looking for 25 grand. He said, they said, if Ori guarantees the money, they'll give it. He said, they're good friends of yours. I said, what's their names? Gives me their name. I don't know these freaking guys. Tommy Piazza and the other guy, using, the agent used the name Marino. And in my head, Marino, I believe, was a case agent on Do Joe Dogs, Joe Iannuzzi, who I also met down in Florida. So now, my girlfriend was back out drinking, doing drugs. I had a date, went to Frankie's, had dinner, I'm sitting there when my friend comes to me. He said, Tommy like Tommy and uh, Marino. They, Tommy wants to say hello. I said, send them over. So I'm sitting in the restaurant. And he comes over. He's got gold chain. He's got all the gold shit on. I'm looking at the guy. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? I don't know him. But he's talking like he's my best friend. And like I've known him for... He said, you don't remember me. I said, no. He said, we met in Palm, I mean Palm Springs. So now I think, wait a minute, did they change Joe Dog's face? Could this be Joe Dog's? I don't know. But he gave me the name Tommy Piazza, and then he tells me he did time with Sonny. Sonny remembers every name. Me and the girl leave. I stopped at the pay phone. I called Sonny, give him the name. He said, I don't know the guy. He says, be careful. And I ended up 
Now he wanted to have a meeting. We edited a Frankie's in the afternoon where they want to start this company. They'll put the 25 grand in as long as I guarantee it. So we're sitting at the table. Tommy's sitting here, my guy's sitting here, and Marino is sitting over there. Got a toothpick in his mouth, penny loafers, and his phone sitting on the thing. And I sat there, I said, oh, gentlemen, I said, if you're willing to loan the money, I guarantee the money. I said, no, no we want to start a company, you got to be part of it. I said, the only way I'll be part of it, you got to form a corporation, all right? We take money out legally, we pay taxes, and I don't want no child porn. We don't do none of that shit, I said. Made that very clear. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sat down, the food was coming. And this Tommy was always showing a lot of money. And I just slumped down in my chair. He looks at me, he says, hey, buddy, what's wrong? I said, now here's this guy proclaiming to be my friend. I said, hey, buddy, come on, I got to talk to you. I took him inside, outside in the back of the parking lot. I said, I'm a little upside down. I said, I need five grand for a few days. Oh, sure, sure. He said, oh. he had five grand on him. He said, can I give you 4,500? I need 500 for the weekend. I said, yeah. He took the 4,500, that 4,500. And he brought the other 500 to me the following Monday, he did. <laughs> and I just kept getting money from him. But I knew he was a flip-flop. Uh, and how I found out was I had a friend that happened to be a US, U.S. Marshal, who I eventually invited uh, introduced to Sonny when he went back to New York. And uh, U.S. Marshal knew everything was going on. And he said, does the guy have a toothpick in his mouth, curly hair, and penny loafers? I said, yeah. And he gave me his name, FBI agent. And obviously, I blew that operation out of, out of the door. And then it's the same agent that said that then there were cable boxes that were missing from L.A. City Jail. And Supposedly, I there was a guy responsible for that, and he was going to get me on interstate transportation, but I never brought nothing out of the state. Well, you ultimately got five years? Five years. Was that a plea deal, or was that... Uh, plea deal. Okay. How much were you facing? Life. Really? You went from life to five years? Yeah. Pretty good deal. Very good deal. How much did you spend on lawyers? Huh? How much did you spend on lawyers? 50,000, okay. but the lawyers that defended me in were appointed lawyers. Oh, it was a court appointed? I, yeah, I, I fired a lawyer in the courtroom, the paid attorney. Uh -huh. Here's what happened. They initially, the arrest was for five kilos of coke. Uh, on the superseding indictment, they increased it to the 50. But the informant, this guy Fittato, uh, there were like two different groups of the Colombo family. And Michael Uvino trial was first, him and about five other guys. And they made a real ass of this informant. Really bad. Actually, Judge Weinstein, who's the oldest living judge still today on the court, proclaimed him the worst informant he's ever seen in his life. He was so bad, they didn't want to use the informant against me, but they wanted to use the tapes. And uh, my attorney had nothing to do with it. Want him in the courtroom. And uh, they just weren't gonna bring him. He was, he was a horrible, horrible witness. But they had, he taped, he taped Sonny every day. Uh, there was Guy Fittato, his name was. So,
Uh, I, when we got ready to go to trial and we went for uh, motions, uh, lemony motions, Sonny's lawyer put a motion in to sever Sonny from the trial or prelude, preclude me from using the discovery that he was going to have me whacked. And I was known as a renegade client to the lawyers of New York. That's what they nicknamed me because I was writing my own motions even though I knew they'd be denied because it's not. This is going to be a boring mo thing for you here. All right? It's all good. Uh, yeah, I knew they'd be de denied because I uh, submitted on my own. They got to be submitted to the attorney. But I knew that my judge read everything. And I put a severance. Uh, I wanted to be severed from the trial. Uh, and I wanted my... Uh, uh, I felt my peers were not in Brooklyn, that my peers were in Los Angeles, which basically is the truth. And I wrote some game good motions. And uh, well, we all helped each other, you know, in prison, write motions. Well, and the judge, I, I'm the one who got severed. Uh, the judge said, no, no way I'm going to sever Mr. Frances from the trial, but I think maybe Mr. Spado should be. Ask the U.S. attorney, you get to noon tomorrow to convince me why Mr. Spado should not be severed. Back in court the next day, he says, your motion for severance is denied, but if you could explain to me in legal terms that that discovery could be used for you or against you, I'll make you make the decision. I got up, I defined exculpatory, inculpatory, and that it could be used either way. And he says, I'm convinced you know, what's your decision? I said, I'll take the severance. And I got off of that, and that was the luckiest day of my life. Well, you got five years at 65 years old. Yeah. A senior citizen, essentially, going into prison for the first time for five years. Was it a hard five years? Be honest with you, no. Was it something I'd like to do again? No. But, you know, it's something that I knew eventually could possibly happen someday. I never dreamed that it would be on a RICO conspiracy back in Brooklyn. And... The day that I did get arrested, you know, they bring you out in handcuffs. They don't chain and shack you. And put me on Swa Drive where I lived in Beverly Hills. There's four tourists, and he said, face down. I'm facing down the street. And he opens his trunk, and the agent takes out the shackles and shackling me, chaining me up. And I'm looking straight ahead. And the next intersection, there's a white van. And I asked the agent, I said, where's my buddy? And I named the agent. Oh, he wanted to come. He couldn't make it today. I said, bullshit. I said, he's taking pictures. He's getting his rocks off. And I believe firmly that FBI are like this. They do their job, they're good. Uh, and like I said, I taped the FBI. I had 12 tapes on them. Uh, one of them, they did get a hold of, and they had an informant posted online saying I'm a rat. There again, an informant calling me a rat. Well, Ori, it's a hell of a story. And ultimately, although you had a, a good run, I don't think anyone aspires to go to prison. Well, by writing my book, The Accidental Gangster, if I could stop one young man 
from entering a life or becoming a gangster, then the book was well worth it. I agree. Well, I appreciate your time, and I wish you all the best. Thank you.